Hello everyone, <clears throat> today I'll be going over the Spring 2013 Test 2 and I've also added like two questions from Deals Alder because uh, Dr. Bean will be combining both material from Test 1 and Test 2 for you guys. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, it's nomenclature. Uh, benzene rings, as Dr. Bean went over in class, there are some common names you should know. I'll go over them at the end of the uh, nomenclature section. Now, let's start with the first one. So the first thing you want to notice is that you have to figure out which one is the parent chain and as we know when you're talking about benzene rings you have to look at the longest chain possible and in this case it's going to be the benzene ring so we know it's going to be benzene and when it comes for subs you want once you once you have your benzene ring as your parent chain everything else should be in alphabetical order so we know that bromo will be number one in this case then methoxy two and then the nitro group will be number three so that's going to be one bromo, two methoxy, and then three nitro. Now putting the whole name together, it's going to be one bromo, two methoxy, three nitro. And then benzene, right? Now, there's another way you can name this because we know that this group is called anisole, right? You can start with anisole, but if we start this way, let me just change the color here. If we start by naming this as anisole, this whole group, then this will be my number one, right? Just keep that in mind. Now, look at the second question. Again, we have to figure out which one is the longest chain, which we have two benzene groups, right? In this case and this case. Now, when you think about this, this one has a carboxylic acid at the end. So this will have a higher priority. And this group, so we have to start counting from this side, one, two, three, four. And we know that this benzene group with carboxylic acid is called benzoic acid. So the parent, parent is called benzoic acid acid now for the subs we only have one sub right and that would be and this is called it's going to be called benzyl so those are kind of confusing you have two types of sub you have like ch2 connect to something this is called benzyl and the other group is going to be just a benzene group that is a sub in this case this is called a phenyl just keep in mind this differences because it, it's just that carbon CH2 right here that makes a difference. So you might miss it sometimes. So just keep an eye for it. So the sub is going to be 4 benzyl. From that, when you put the whole name together, it's going to be 4 benzyl benzoic acid. Benzoic. Pretty straightforward. Now, looking at this one, uh, we can see that we have you know, aldehyde and we have a ketone. And as we know, an aldehyde has a higher priority than a ketone, so we'll take the aldehyde as our main chain. One, one, two, three, four. Even though this one is shorter than the than the cyclohexanone. So, because we have a, a four carbon, that's gonna be butanal, the root. Butanol. And as we can see on num on carbon number four, we have the cyclohexane, right? So for the sub, it's gonna be four. And we have a ketone group here, which is gonna be four, two oxo uh, cyclohexyl because it's a sub. So now let's put the whole name together. And the reason why it's number two is because you start coming from here for the subs, right? So one, two. So now let's put the whole name together. It's going to be four, two oxo, cyclohexyl, cyclohexyl, and then butanol, butanol.
Now let's look at this one. Again, this one has a ketone group and an alkene group, and this, this chain is longer, so it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is gonna be my parent chain or root. Uh, we know it's gonna be a heptan, right? But we have an alkene, we have a ketone, which is gonna be hept. And it's carbon number one, we're gonna have the ketone, I mean the alkene, hept, one in, and then three on. I mean, three on. Also, you don't have to put one. You can just put hept in three on because, you know, you're all already inferring that you're the alkene as well, number one, if you don't put a number. Now, for subs, that's what I was talking about before. In this case, this is a phenyl group. See, it's just a benzene ring that's connected to the main chain as compared to a benzyl, which is a benzene ring connected to a carb to a CH2 connected to the main chain. So that would be 7-phenyl. So putting the whole name together, it would be 7-phenyl hept 1-in-3-on. Also, remember guys that every time you have a number and a letter, you always put a dash between them, right? Just keep that in mind. All right, now let me go over the name the nomenclature, the common names of some of those benzene rings substitution ones that you have to know. So the first one is gonna be toluene, which is just a benzene ring with a CH3. It's called toluene. Second one is gonna be anisole that I mentioned earlier, OCH3. So it's called anisole. And then you have benzoic acid, C double bond o OH, it's gonna be benzoic acid. Then we have uh, aniline, which is just an NH2, so that would be aniline. Uh, we have also, I said benzoic acid, benzaldehyde, which is a, just a benzene ring with an aldehyde group connected to it. It's called benzaldehyde. Uh, we have also acetophenone. One CH3, which is a ketone. So that's called acetophenone. Uh, we also have styrene, which is a uh, benzene ring connected to an alkene group. That's called styrene. And you also have, you know, the common one, which we all know, phenol OH. Let me see if I'm missing any of them. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep. Those are the eight common names that you guys should know. You don't really have to use them. So, so for instance, if you're using like N, so you can name it like 1-methoxybenzene. Right? You don't have to really use N so in this case. But why I'm, why why you should guys know them? Because she can give you like, you know, the name and then you, get, you have to figure out the structure. So that's why you have to know these. All right, so moving on. Uh, label the molecules below in a aromatic, AR, anti-aromatic, AA, or non-aromatic, NA. Please assume all are planar. All right, so before I jump into this question, let me go over the rules of aromatic, non-aromatic, and then anti-aromatic. So we have aromatic, anti-aromatic, anti-aromatic, and non-aromatic. When we're looking at aromatic, there's a couple of rules that you should follow. So for aromatic, number one rule is it has, the structure has to be cyclic. And how I like to think about these is just like a checkbox, right? If it fits all this criteria, then it's cyclic. If it's uh, conjugated, conjugated, if it is a flat and if it follows the 4n plus 2 rule 
For anti-aromatic, all the rules are the same except for one. So it has to be cyclic, conjugated, conjugated. It has to be also flat. And finally, the difference here is that it follows the 4n rule and not the 4n plus 2 rule. Now, for non-aromatic, is it a structure is non-aromatic if it breaks any of those rules. If it breaks any one of those rules. Those rules. Now, when we're looking at stability, it's always that aromatic is more stable than non-aromatic, which is much more stable than anti-aromatic. So keep that in mind, because sometimes you have cases where you have to choose between non-aromatic and anti-aromatic. And if you can't choose non-aromatic, you would choose non-aromatic over anti-aromatic. And you would choose aromatic over non-aromatic. So keep those in mind. Uh, and one rule that we can also, in this, in this specific problem, we can assume is that it's always flat. So this is kind of checked out. We don't have to worry about that. Now let's jump into the questions. So for the first one, we can see that uh, we have all sp2 hybridized carbons. Now, and it's cyclic, it's flat as we mentioned. Now, the only thing that we can see here that is that we have that oxygen right here. Now, that oxygen is sp3 hybridized. So if it's sp3 hybridized, it, br it breaks the conjugation rule. So the, the, the cyclic compound is not conjugated, meaning it's non-aromatic. But because what this one can do is it can donate one of its uh, lone electrons into an empty p orbital, and we can assume that it is sp2. Now, if it's sp2 hybridized, you're counting one of those lone pairs that are donated into the p orbital of the ring. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight pi electrons. All right, so we have eight electrons. If it's eight electrons, then it follows the four n rule. And if it follows the four n rule, because you know, four n is equal to eight, n is equal to two, that means it's anti-aromatic. So in this case, the electrons of the oxygen are more preferable to stay on the p orbital of the oxygen and not being donated to the p orbital of the ring, meaning we will choose non-aromatic over anti-aromatic because non-aromatic is more stable than anti-aromatic. So I would put Na. All right. All right. Now moving on. Again, we have the same case here. This this boron here is sp two hybridized, so we don't have to worry about it. Now, when we look at the oxygen, we also have the same thing, right? This can be sp3 hybridized, and if it's sp3 hybridized, then it is non-aromatic. But if it's sp2 hybridized, and we're counting one of those lone pairs that are being donated into the p orbital, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six electrons that contribute in the p orbitals. So that means that it follows the 4n plus 2 rule equal to six. Right, so that being said, it's gonna be aromatic, right? So, and n is equal to one, obviously. So in this case, between aromatic and non-aromatic, I would choose aromatic because aromatic, as we mentioned before, is more stable than non-aromatic. Now, moving on. Also, another thing that I would mention is that when you're saying conjugated, is that means that all the atoms in the cyclic ring, because sometimes you have oxygen and nitrogen, are in the sp2 hybridized, or no sp3 hybridized atoms in it. Right? The only time you can decide between sp2 and sp3 hybridized if there is a lone pair on like a group like an oxygen or a nitrogen. Now moving on, again we have the same thing. It's cyclic, right? It is. Uh, Con everything is conjugated slash sp2 hybridized except for that oxygen again right uh flat we assume that and then we have to see if it follows the 4n plus 2 rule or the 4n now as we mentioned before let's assume that we're going to use one of those uh, lone pairs uh being donated to the empty p orbit of the ring meaning if it's sp2 hybridized it follows the one two three, four, five, six. So that's a four N plus two rule. 
equal to 6, that means n is equal to 1, meaning it's aromatic. That being said, aromatic is more stable than non-aromatic, so we just go with aromatic. Now for the last one, um, a good thing about fused rings, those are called fused rings, and the good thing about them is that you can always assume that those are a flat, right? But we don't have to worry here, here about it because she said that everything is planar or flat. The other thing is when you're looking at those groups, you always count the peripheral, peripheral uh, carbons. This one doesn't play a role, the spy bond, because it's uh, it doesn't localize. It's not lo localized. So that being said, let me count, let me count the number of the electrons. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So we have fourteen electrons. Fourteen electrons. So based on that, we know it follows the four n plus two rule equal to 14, meaning that n is equal to 3. So that being said, it's going to be aromatic. It's not really that difficult once you get the hang of it and for, you know how to follow the rules and stuff. All right, so moving on, uh, rank the following substituted uh, benzene compounds in order of increasing rate in an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. So the first thing that we have to think about when we hear electrophilic aromatic substitution, also as EAS reaction, is that you always want to think the opposite. When it's electrophilic aromatic substitution, the nucleo the aromatic ring, the aromatic ring is the nucleophile. That's a quick way to remember. If it's EAS, the ring is the uh, nucleophile. If it's NAS, the ring is the electrophile. So we know that a nucleophile should be electron rich. And for a group to be an electron rich, it, if, it, if a aromatic ring has electron donating groups, it would be more favored. If it's more favored, then the reaction is faster. So looking at those three groups, we notice that this one and this one is an electron withdrawn group. But this one is an electron donating group, right? It can donate to the ring and then resonate. So we can tell that this is going to be the fastest rate because it's the most nucleophilic. Now, let's look at the other two. When we look at these two, at first glance, you're not going to see any, like they're both, you're going to think they're both electron withdrawing groups, right? But if you notice, there's this oxygen then that, that makes a difference, it makes a big difference here. And why is that? Is because this group can withdraw electrons. Half of it will be resonating. On, half of it will be resonating from the benzene ring, and half of it will be resonating from this oxygen. However, in this case here, you cannot do that. It can only resonate from the benzene ring. This one can withdraw electron fifty percent less than the second one right because uh, you know the resonance is not always in one structure it's just a mixture right it goes back and forth so that being said i can tell that this one is less electron withdrawing making it a more nucleophilic aromatic ring making it a faster reaction than the middle one so that would be number two and that would be my number one i don't know if that made sense but you have to think about it as like in this in between those two you have to think about it as which one of these is less electron withdrawing group, All right? Uh, so moving on to number three, uh, rank the following in compounds in order of increasing acidity, one being least acidic and one being the most acidic. And uh, you guys remember when we talked about acidity, that's from orgo one, the more stable the anion is, the more stable, That means it's the more acidic. More acidic. And it's vice versa for a uh, base. Now when you get when you get when when you see such a question, you always want to start by deprotonating. And in this case, we only have like one carbon that can get deprotonated in this case because it's the one that's sp3 hybridized. So I would deprotonate this one, deprotonate this carbon right here, and deprotonate this carbon right here. 
and you can tell here that you should all, all here in, in this case scenario you should look at aromaticity and uh, which aromatic name is going to be the more stable and as we mentioned before aromatic is more stable non-aromatic is the second most stable and uh, anti-aromatic is the least stable so let's look at the first one So for this one, we have one, wait, first of all, it, it's cyclic, right? It is uh, flat. It is, uh, what else are we looking for? Uh, is it conjugated? Yes, it is. We have this carbon right here, which has the lone pair that can be donated into the P orbitals. Meaning that from, D, from, from that, we can start counting the number of electrons that are donated into the P orbitals. So that being said, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we have 10 electrons, which means this one follows the 4n plus 2 rule. 4n plus 2 rule equal to 10. That means that n is equal to 2. So that means it's aromatic. And as we know, aromatic is the more, most stable. Most stable. That being said, it's the most acidic in this case. Most acidic. <coughs> So we'll take number three. Now we're looking at the second one. We can immediately know that it broke one of the major rules, which is cyclic. It's not cyclic, so it's non-aromatic. All right, now let's look at the last one, and then we can decide which one will be uh, the second most stable and which one will be the least stable. So looking at this one, that's cyclic, flat, conjugated. Now we have to look into counting the electrons. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It has eight electrons, which means it is, it follows the four-end rule, which means it is anti-aromatic. And because we know it's anti-aromatic is the least stable, that means this one is the least acidic. And this one is the second most acidic. All right, so now moving on. Uh, it's asking us to rank the following compounds in order of increasing wavelength of the transition in the UV spectrum one being the shortest wavelength and three being the longest wavelength so what i usually do for what i usually do for these problems is i try to think in like chemistry general chemistry uh formula and we know that energy is equal to Planck's constant times frequency i'm gonna just write the the sign of frequency is this v i'm just gonna write this f just to make it easier for us <clears throat> and we know that a compound the more stable a compound is the more stable a compound is the lower the energy and if we have lower energy because those are uh, you know uh, h times f that means that f will be or frequency will be lower so the lower the frequency lower the frequency and we know that frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength because F is equal to alpha over lambda. I don't really remember the formula. You don't have to know it. Just know that they're inversely proportional. So the lower frequency, actually, the higher the wavelength. So based on this analogy, we have to look at the stability of these uh, alkenes, multi-alkene, actually, polyalkenes. So... First thing first, we always have to remember that something that's conjugated is always more stable than something that is not conjugated. So looking at these, we have double bond, single, single, double, single, double, single, right? But the other ones are going to be double, single, double, single, double. So that's conjugated. And same thing for this one. It's double, single, double, single, double. So these two are conjugated. So those are automatically more stable than the first one. So we know that the first one is going to be the least stable because it's not conjugated. Conjugated. So if it's not conjugated, it is the least stable. And if it's the least stable, it will have the highest energy, which will have the highest frequency. So let me write these out. Highest energy, right? Highest energy, meaning it will have the highest frequency meaning it will have the lowest wavelength. So that would be my number one. Now, looking at the other two, we should also know something about alkenes, is that the more substituted the alkene is, the more stable it is. And if we look at the those alkenes, we can see that the first one is 
one, two, three substituted. Well, it's quadra substituted. It has four substituents. And this one has one, two substituted. Same thing with this one. It's one, two, three substituted. There's none of these alkenes are quadra substituted. They're all the, the highest one between them is tri substituted. So that means because this one is quadra substituted, this one is going to be more stable, which means we'll have the lowest frequency, which means we'll have the highest wavelength. So that would be my number three. And then for the last one, we know it's in between those two. So that would be my second highest wavelength. So that would be my number two. I hope that made sense. I like to think about it this way. I know some people think about it in a different way. They just memorize, you know, the more stable, the higher, the, the more stable, the lower the frequency. I just like to think about it in the formula way because during the exam, I know, you know, you have so many things to remember and you can forget those tiny things. All right, now, so let's move on to the reaction section. All right, so looking at the first one, first the reaction question, uh, we can say it's going to be like a benzene reaction, right? And we know that this is going to be a Hakko-Alko-Kako reaction. I like to call it this way so I can remember it. It's also called getterman koch form formation or we're just trying to form a uh, benzaldehyde. Oh, actually, here there's a mistake. There should be a OCH3 there, right here. So, the first thing you gotta look at, we have we know that we have three benzene rings, so this reaction can happen with any of these, right? But we have to look the, at the ring that's most activated. We know this one has has an activating group, which is the CH3. This one has an OCH3, and this one has no act. Well, it does have an activating group, which is this whole thing, but we have to look at the strongest activating group slash electron donating group, and that would be the methoxy, right? So knowing that, we know that the benzene ring in the middle is going to be the one reacting. So we're going to have a benzene ring, connect to another benzene ring, connect to a benzene ring with CH3. Now when we're looking at this, uh, a couple of things you have to notice is when you have no CH3 here, right? The thing is, you have to determine where is that aldehyde is going to be added. There are two positions. Remember, when we're doing, uh, when we have an electron donating group slash activating, we're always looking at para ortho positioning. And in this case, it can be ortho right here or the pair right here, the OCH3. Now, the other position, the other ortho position is occupied, so we cannot actually put it there. So, based on that, I would, uh, what I would do here is because the benzene ring is bulky, right? You have this group bulky here and this group here. I would go ahead with the para positioning just because there's less steric hindrance there. Right? And also it's 50-50. Now, usually ortho, usually it's more likely to have ortho group, ortho positioning just because it's more likely to happen. But if you have bulky groups, that's not really the case. So I would put it on the para positioning, which is going to be here. Just adding an aldehyde, double OH. Uh, now moving on, so zinc with uh, mercury and HCl, that's a reducing agent, that's a strong reducing agent. It can reduce uh, aldehyde, carboxylic acid, all the way to a uh, CH3 or just remove the carboxylic groups. Uh, and this is called Clemenson reduction. So that would give you benzene rings, benzene ring, and benzene ring. We have a CH3 right here. We have an OCH3 right here. And instead of an aldehyde, it's gonna go all the way back to a CH3. Am I missing something? No. All right, so uh, moving on. Uh, again, we have SO3H with BR2 and FeBr3. We know that SO3H is gonna be an electron withdrawing group, a deactivating group. So if we know that's a deactivating group, it's always going to go into the meta position. Electron uh, withdrawing group, which means it's going to go into the meta position. So we have SO3H here. And it's going to the meta position. Right here, we're going to add the BR. Now the next one is going to be HSO2O4 fuming. So what we're trying to add is we're trying to add a uh, SO3H. And again, if you have both an activating and deactivating group and you're trying to do a reaction on the benzene ring, you always take it, you always take into consideration the activating group. So in this case, it's either gonna be ortho or para to it. In this case, I would choose ortho uh, because you have it's more likely to be on the ortho positioning. 
you have two ortho positioning as compared to one para. So we have a BR here, we have SO3H here. And finally, we're gonna add the, the, SO, the second SO3H is gonna be ortho to the BR. I don't, I, want, I don't want to put it here just because there's BR and SO3H, which is also a static hindrance. So I would go with the uh, ortho positioning, this, this positioning right here. Now CH3O minus Na plus at 100 degrees Celsius, there's just going to be a, a substitution. So what you're going to end up with, it's going to replace the BR, and then you're going to have a uh, OCH3. And remember, for this reaction to occur, you need an electron withdrawing group on the para or the ortho positioning to stabilize the negative charge using resonance. Just keep that in mind. And OCH, this is a really important mechanism to know, and I think you should go, you should guys go over it. SO3H, and you have an SO3H here. So this SO3H, this electron withdrawing group right here, actually helped with the nucleophilic aromatic substitution here, right? So otherwise that, that reaction would have not occur if you didn't have the electron withdrawing group on the ortho position or para positioning. And the reason to why is that is because the negative charge is stabilized with that electron withdrawing group. All right, so uh, moving on to the next question. So we have also a benzene ring reaction. We have two groups. We have a electron withdrawing, electron donating group, which is the NH. And we have a uh, CL, which is an electron activating, uh, it's an activating group. Uh, so first thing first, we have an acylation reaction, Friedel-Craft acylation. And for this reaction to occur, we need to have a uh, donating group. And between those two groups, between the activating groups, chlorine and the NH, NHC, double bond OCH3, the NH is a stronger activating group. This is why you have to follow the directioning of this group. You always follow the stronger activating group. So that means you have an NH, C double bond O, CH3. You have a chlorine right here. And then because we're following this group, uh, again, in this case, you have 50-50% of it being on ortho and para. I would go with para here in this situation just because, uh, you know, if it's 50-50, there's this whole group next to it, which is steric hindered. I would go with the para positioning just because it's easier. Also, there's a C double bond O here, which I don't know why this exam has so many mistakes in the printout. Maybe when they printed out, they just, you know, the printer wasn't good or something. So CH2, CH3. And then the next thing is going to be lithium NH3 and CH3OH. And um, what this does is it's going to reduce the benzene ring. But we have to notice something here. It's called Birch reduction. And what we have to notice here is, is if you have an electron withdrawing group, that group on that carbon should be sp3 hybridized. But if it's a donating group, it should be sp2 hybridized. And if you have both, like in this situation here, where we have this carbon right here is on an S, on on a group here, and the, and on this carbon right here, an electron withdrawing group, you always follow the electron withdrawing group directioning. So what I'm trying to say is, this would end up. C double bond O, CH2, CH3, and then you have NH, C double bond O, CH3, and then you have a chlorine. So we know this is my electron withdrawing group. This carbon right here, if you have an electron withdrawing group, has to be sp3 hybridized. If it was, if you only had electron donating group, so let's pretend we had this group right here. OCH3, right? And then we're doing Birch reduction on it. What would happen is you would end up with this. An OCH3. And that's because this carbon has to be sp2 hybridized. Because we have an electron donating group instead of an electron withdrawing group. So if you have an electron withdrawing group, it's going to be sp3 hybridized. If you have an electron donating group, it's going to be sp2 hybridized. And just keep that. That's just another step. That's something separate. It's not with this reaction, that's Birch reduction. So uh, moving on to question number four. We have Na2Cr2O7, H2SO4 at 100 degrees Celsius. As you know, this is an oxidizing agent. This is a strong oxidizing agent, especially on benzylic carbons. Now, the first thing you have to notice is for, for you to be able to do an oxidation, you have to have 
a carbon with a hydrogen. So this carbon right here cannot do an oxidation because it doesn't have a hydrogen. And we can define oxidation as the loss of hydrogen bonds or the gain of oxygen bonds. So the stereobutyl carbon here cannot be oxidized. However, this one can be oxidized all the way to a carboxylic acid. As we mentioned, it's a strong oxidizing agent. Now, the second one is going to be a Curry-House reaction. So what would you end up with is instead of having that OH, well, in the second step, you're just going to have O minuses, which are going to be stabilized using lithium. C O minus with Li plus. O minus with Li plus. And then from this side, you'll have a CH2, CH2, CH3. All right, now the last step is going to convert, convert those O minus lithium into a carbonium. So you end up with C, double bond O, CH2, CH2, CH3. That's pretty much it. This is an old reaction that I think it's from Orgo, at the beginning of Orgo 2 or at the end of Orgo 1, I don't really remember. But the important thing here is to remember how this, how this strong oxidizing agent plays a role on, the ben, uh, on uh, benzene rings. And you have to remember that this carbon right here cannot be oxidized because it does not have any hydrogens. So uh, moving on, we have a carboxylic acid with SOCl2. So what this does is it becomes a good uh, acyl product. So that would be CH2, C double bond O, Cl. And next thing is going to be Curry-House reaction, which means it's like it forms a carbon-carbon bond. And what you're doing is you're just adding that CH3, CH2 here. And as you guys remember from Orgo 1, you don't really have to know the mechanism for this one because it's complicated. Dr. Bean doesn't go over it in class even. You just have to remember that you're going to form a carbon-carbon bond. So you have a CH2, C double bond O, uh, CH2, CH3. So for the following question, we have a Grignard reaction. We have a Grignard reagent, uh, and we have two partially positive carbons. So we're looking at the partially positive carbons. We have this carbon here and this carbon here. This is partially positive, and this is partially positive. And what this can do is can attack this, carb this carbonyl carbon here, and it can attack also this carbon right here. So if it attacks them, we know that this will form an O minus, and this will form an N minus. So that would be a hydrogen, O minus, and then you'll have a benzene ring right here. And then for, wait, am I? No, that's right. So you have a C, double bond, N minus, and then you'll have a benzene ring. I'm not really sure if you covered the, this reaction specifically in class, but I think she'll she'll have it on the test. So next thing, when you, uh, when you use HTO plus to protonate it, as we know, the O minus will go all the way to a uh, alcohol. One, two, You'll have an OH right here, a hydrogen, a benzene ring. And then from the other side, you'll have this carbon, the benzene ring. Now, this nitrogen group will not stay as nitrogen, it becomes a double bond O, it becomes a ketone. So keep that in mind. And for the last reaction that I added, this is, you're not going to see on the, on the on the PDF that, yeah, I, gave, that I gave you guys. Um, this, I added that from test one. But what would happen here is just it deals all the reaction. So because I know that uh, exam two for you guys are going to combine both exam one and exam two. So... The first thing that I would like to do before I, you know, before I start looking into the mechanism and how to draw this, I would start counting number of carbons and how the bond will be formed. So we know that this will attack right here, the diene, attack the dienophile, and this will resonate right here. Now, if we notice something is, we know this is my electron donating group, and this is my electron withdrawing group. So the bond, if you want to count them, you've got one, two, three, four, five, and six. And remember, guys, from uh, the beginning of Orgo 2, that we mentioned that you cannot have a one, three between the uh, electron donating group and the electron withdrawing group. So it has to be either one, two, or one, four, which is the more stable. 
So what we have to do here is we have to flip the dynamo file. So now you have a double mode over here and right there. And now, actually, let me adjust the page here so it'll make it easier. So if I flip the Dino file, and I have the Dino, and OCH3, now, if I do the counting, I'll have a 1, 2, 3, and 4 which is a 1-4 substituent, which is more stable than a 1-3. Always remember, 1-4 and 1-3 are more favored than, I mean, 1-4 and 1-2, not 1-3, are more favored than 1-3. Just keep that in mind. So let's draw the whole thing. Uh, another thing that I should mention here that this, those two are going to be raised up and form a bridged cyclohexane. So... That would look something like that. The other thing that I like to do is numbering everything. So as I start one, two, three, four, three, five, six. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now looking at carbon number three, we know it's connected to this the rest of the cyclohexane with the double bond O. And we also know that now we have a bond between carbon one and carbon six. And on carbon number one, we also have the donating group, which is OCH3. Another thing that I should mention is that the electron withdrawing group is gonna be also always on indoor positioning. So it should be on a dash, right? But because I don't like drawing a cyclohexane on a dash, what Dr. Bean usually does is she just draws the hydrogens on the wedge which emphasizes that this ring is on an end of positioning, right? So that's pretty much it for the end, uh, for the Diels Alder reaction. I don't think she's gonna have many questions about it. She'll probably have like two or three questions. And uh, yeah, so let's move on to the mechanism section. This is a good mechanism question. And now, if you notice, if you guys have been doing uh, some of her old questions and her practice questions that she posts, you notice that now you have to worry about drawing the more than one resonance contributor, maybe drawn. Be sure to draw the most stable contributor. That's really important right here. You have to always draw the most stable uh, contributor. So as you can see now, you not only have to draw the resonance structure that you need to use, you also have to draw the most stable one. And you'll see a little bit further on what that means. So first thing first, ALCL3 is a catalyst. So what start what started happening is that the chlorine, once the chlorine lone pairs, they grab that ALCL3. And why we're doing that is because we need to have a good leaving group for the reaction to start occurring. So we have an OCH3. A double bond O C L A L C L3. Actually, let me just not draw that, try it this way. ALCL3. So that ALCL3 now is negatively charged, this chlorine is positively charged. Now this ALCL3 is a good leaving group, and what's going to happen is it's just going to leave. But well, the ALCL4, not ALCL3. So now you have benzene ring with a carbonyl carbon right here, which was already partially positive, now it's fully positive. Here we have, oh, I forgot a carbon here. And an OCH3. And also another thing that I forgot is that I want to draw those bonds as so, just to be able to show the mechanism, right? So a quick thing to notice here is that my benzene ring is going to act as a nucleophile. And why is that favored is because we also have an electron donating group, which favored to act as nucleophile. So this is like a EAS reaction. <clears throat> where my aromatic group will kind of act as a nucleophile and attack that uh, partially positive carbon. So what would happen is, is gonna, one of those uh, elect one of those pi bonds in the benzene ring is going to attack that carbonyl carbon that's partially positive, and you're going to form a second ring. So again, what I like to do, 
and that's my uh, you know I just like to do it this way I like to number everything so I know that now I have one two three four five six so I know that one and six now there is a bond so I can keep track of it but before we go any further you have to draw the resonance of this even though we're not going to be using the resonance of this of uh, the the other resonance contributor you have to still draw the more stable one so this can rotate can resonate and then you're going to end up with a benzene ring one two three oxygen is going to be positively charged right and well actually let me draw it because this is technically wrong because that's 180 degrees so it should be c one two three oxygen so this is the more stable resonance contributor even though we're not going to use it i still have to draw it just keep that in mind so now moving on i'm going to have this benzene ring and i'm going to have three four five so let me number everything so I can keep track of everything. So I have one, two, three, four, five, and six. And I have a OCH3 right there that I forgot to draw. OCH3. We didn't touch this bond and we didn't touch that bond. Now let's look where to add the carbony i want to where to add that methyl. We see that on carbon number five I have a methyl, so I'm just gonna add that methyl right here. And on carbon number six, which is here, I have a ketone. Now, remember, even we did this reaction, we still have a positive charge somewhere that we have to figure out. So if we look, it used to be on carbon number six, but carbon number six is now satisfied with four bonds. Carbon number one also has four bonds, it has a hydrogen. and But carbon number two is actually positively charged because it has only three bonds. So now, if you look at our product, we're almost there. Oh, there's an oxygen here that they forgot. <laughs> I don't know what's up with this uh, printout, but so if we, yeah, as I was saying, if we look at the pro uh, if we look at our product, we were able to deform our uh, aromaticity. So to do that, we're gonna use the AlCl4 negatively charged because remember AlCl3 was used as a catalyst, and as we know, catalyst will return to its initial uh, form. So what's gonna happen, this AlCl4 is gonna grab the hydrogen and kick off a double bond right here. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna form AlCl3 again and HCl and our product, which is gonna be this group right here. We'll have a CH3 a double bond O and OCH3. Now, the other thing that I forgot to draw here is the resonance contributors. Remember what I said earlier, we always have to draw the most stable resonance contributor. And to do that, this, um, I'm trying to, uh, it's not gonna fit there. So let me just add that right here. So we know that this can resonate, right? OCH3, the positive charge right here. And then the last one, well, the most stable one that I'm gonna draw is this lone pair is gonna be donated right here and you're gonna be able to form Double bond OCH3, positively charged. So this one, you don't really need to draw this one just because this one is not the most stable one. You have to draw always, you have to always draw the most stable contributor, right? So just keep that in mind. And yeah, that's pretty much the mechanism. It's just an EAS reaction. Well, it's an intracellular, uh, intramolecular EAS reaction. So, Moving on to synthesis now. 
So first thing first that we can see in the synthesis question is we can see the symmetry in those two in those two rings, right? If you split right here in the middle, you can see that those two structures are the same. Now before we start, uh, we she said that synthesize the molecule below using benzene, alcohol of three carbons or less, or any inorganic reagent, any oxidizing or reducing agent, and any peroxy acids. So the first thing, as I mentioned before, is that there is a symmetry between those two, uh, those two benzene rings, right? This one looks like that, and this one looks like this one. So what we could do is we can start by splitting it right here, and do a uh, nucleophilic aromatic substitution. And what that would look like is benzene ring C double bond O C H two one two. CH2, CH3, right, one, two, this is messed up too, one, two, three, one, two, three carbon, there should be a CH2 here. And we're going to have an NO2 right here, and a BR. And then with that, we can just use, and a, NAS here is actually possible, because we have electron withdrawing group on ortho, and para positioning, which will stabilize the uh, negatively charge, the way the, which will stabilize the negative charge. C double bond O, CH two, CH three, and we're gonna have an O minus. All right, so based on that, we can just do an NaS reaction. Now, from here, what we can do is we can to form this O minus. We can start with a bromine and go to an O minus using an AOH at two equivalent and heat. So that would look something like that. An AOH at two equivalents and heat. What we could start from here is we're gonna start with a with a uh, bromine. And O2. And that's actually a good thing that we did it this way because now if you can notice that these, this group and that group are actually now the same, so we can just synthesize one of them. Now, what I like to do here is always look at the activating group, right? If you notice, if we look at the activating group right here, we notice that there is an NO2 here and the uh, C double bond OCH2CH3 OCH here. So what I like to do, especially if they're on the para and the ortho positioning. So what I like to do here is I like to keep the BR till, till I add it at the end or well, remove it at the end if we're going backwards. So what I mean by that, let's start by adding the C double bond OCH3 here. And we can do that by using Fieldcraft acylation. And we'll use ALCL3, a BR right here, NO2, plus a CH2, CH3, C double bond OCL. We can use SOCL2 and we can start from a carboxylic acid and because Dr. Bean said we can start with a three carbon alcohol we can just oxidize a, a primary alcohol all the way to carboxylic acid using uh, Jones oxidant right Jones oxidant and that would start with CH2 CH3 CH2 OH Remember, you cannot use PCC here because that will take all the way to a uh, aldehyde. Now, let's try to add the NO2, which we can do using HNO3 slash H2SO4. HNO3 slash H2SO4. Again, having the BR here is an activating and will direct to add the NO2 on the, pair, on the ortho positioning. Now that we have that group, we can then form that BR, that uh, benzene group with a BR. So we can start with BR2 and FeBr3, which one of the first reactions that we learned, the halogenation of a benzene ring. And that's the beginning. So she said we can start with a benzene ring, which we did. We start with three carbon alcohol. We did that and everything uh, you know matches. Maybe there's another way to do it if you convert use like a, a reduce the strong reducing agent zinc and the mercury and reduce that all the way to an alkane and then you can add the br first and then add that group at the end you can do that 
but I just figured out this way is easier at least for me. But there's also always other methods you can do that. So we're uh, moving into spectroscopy section. Again, as we've done before, the first thing you want to do is you want to calculate the unsaturation, unsaturation number. Unsaturation number, and the formula is two times the number of carbons plus two minus the number of hydrogens divided by two. So that would be 22 minus 12 divided by two, which is five. And remember, when we see some such a high number, four more, there is usually a benzene ring. So I would assume that there is a benzene ring and there is a double bond, right? Or a benzene ring and, a, and this cyclic group, but it's probably a benzene ring with a double bond. So let's look into it. Uh, first thing first, we notice that there's this strong peak at about 1700-ish. And that indicates the presence of a carbonyl carbon. Those are just CH stretches. Uh, I know you guys learned in the lab that any, like there are some peaks here that would indicate the presence of a benzene ring, but that is hard to tell. And we'll see later on how we can tell that there's a benzene ring here. So as we mentioned, there's probably a benzene ring because the number of uh, unsaturated number is so high. Now, if we look at those two peaks right here, between 7 and 8.5 usually ish ppm it indicates that there is a benzene ring and not just any benzene ring but also indicates because those two positioning those two peaks like that indicates the presence of a para substituted benzene ring so that's a big thing to know so we know that we have that and we know we have a carbonyl carbon as of right now now let's look here we have a ch3 right and that ch3 because it has three peaks that means it's connected to a CH2, right? And we know we have a CH3 right here, here connect to a carbon that has no hydrogens. Not just that, you can see how much downfield this is. This tells you that it's probably next to something with an electron withdrawing group. Same thing with this one. This is a CH2. Connect to one, two, three, four. There are four peaks, so that's uh, four minus one, it's three, so CH3. So this is probably the same as this group. And that CH2 is also downfield. We could assume that that could be due to the benzene ring, right? Which can also cause a downfield in the peak. Now, let's try to you know assume something and try to draw it out. If we draw the benzene ring, Let's pretend, as we said, there is a CH2 with a CH3, and then we have a uh, C double bond O with a CH3. Right? That's the only way it can happen, right, as of right now. So let's try to look back and see if everything matches. So first of all, we have a CH3, right, which is going to be 3H with a triplet, right, because it's 2 plus 1, so it should be 3 peaks. And that one should not be downfield because not anything next to something that it does electron withdrawing group. So it should not be downfield. And that one matches this one, which is right. Now this CH3 right here, this carbon doesn't have any hydrogen. So it's a 2H with a 3 plus 1. So it should be a quadrat. So it has four peaks. And that's indicated by this peak right here. And it's downfield due to the benzene ring next to it. Now the other ones that those two H's are these. Right. Remember, this carbon, this hydrogen, and this hydrogen are the same, and this hydrogen and this hydrogen are the same. So that's why we have a 2H and a 2H. This is due to the symmetry. Now looking at the last one, we have a CH3 right here. And that CH3 would be a 3H with a uh, single peak because it's going to be 0 plus 1, which is 1. So that being said, it should be also downfield due to the carbonyl carbon. So that's indicated by this peak right here. And so it matches. So the final product would look something like this. C double bond O, CH3, and then a CH2, CH3. I hope that made sense. So I've added a couple of multiple choice questions from the ACS booklet that we'll be going over. So first question is, which structure to present a major intermediate uh, in the bromination of nitrobenzene. So, so we know the structure of nitrobenzene is NO2 plus, for the bromination of the benzene ring, it should be like BR2, FeBr3. So, 
first thing first, we know that this is going to act as the electrophile. And the BR is going to act as the nucleophile. Nucleophile. So knowing that, we can immediately take out uh, B and D because they have a negative charge. If this was acting as the electrophile, it should have a positive charge, carbon, like a uh, carbon cation. Right? It cannot have a uh, negative charge. So knowing that, B and D are out of the picture. Now, when we look at A and C, we know that NO2 is a is a uh, metadirector. But why? Let's look. Let's look into C. Right. Let's draw the intermediate. Let's draw the intermediate C. NO2. That's positively charged. We have a Br and we have a hydrogen. If we keep on drawing the the uh, resin structure. We'll have a positive charge right here with an NO2. We know that NO2 is a electron withdrawing group, making it partially positive. And that's a positive group right here. Positive and positive cause uh, are not stable to be next to each other. And this is one of the reasons why the electron withdrawing group or deactivating groups are uh, meta directors. So from that, we can tell that C is not the actual answer and that a should be the answer because we we like you don't have to you know uh understand the mechanism well you have to understand the mechanism but you don't need to draw the whole mechanism for this one you can just we know that br i mean no2 is a meta director and not a para ortho director so a is the actual answer so now moving on to question number two so it's asking us here, arrange the of the easing reactivity fastest to slowest towards hno3 h2so4 so first thing first, we know that activating group will make the reaction faster uh, and the electrical drawing group will make the reaction uh, slower, sometimes no reaction if it occurs. So the first thing first is that the, activate, the, de the deactivating group number three, having a, a, the benzoic acid or uh, having carboxylic acid on it is a deactivating group slash electron withdrawing group, which will make the slowest reaction. So we know that from that, that a is not going to be the answer because they're saying that three is the fastest. So this one's out of the picture. Now let's compare one, two, and four. So we know having electron donating group will make the reaction faster, right? And in this case, we know that CH3 is an electron donating group by induction. Uh, BR is a, is a kind of an exception that Dr. Bing goes over that it has two sides. It can be, it can, it, it, it's an electron uh, it's it's stabilized by resonance, but it's actually a withdrawing group by induction. So it's not the fastest and it's not the slowest, right? So we from that analogy, we know that CH, having a CH3, which is a, a activating group and an electron donating group by induction, should be the fastest. So that being said, we have option D and option C. Option B is also out of the picture. Now we have the side between one and two. As I mentioned before, while bromine is an ortho para director making it a, in quotation, activating group, it can also have two sides, right? The resonance effect and the inductive effect. Uh, the resonance effect uh, will make it a, uh, uh, a electron donating group and stabilizing the positive charge. But the electron, uh, but the inductive effect will cause it to be like an electron withdrawing group and slowing the reaction down. So it's not the fastest. It's not faster than having a benzene, right? So that's why I would go with C here and not D. D is wrong. So as I mentioned, this is a kind of confusing question because we go as BR is an activating group. It's not really an activating group. It's it's a weak activating group if, we, if you want to think about it this way because it has the inductive effect and when you do the resin structure it helps it stabilize uh, the positive charge so that's why it's it, it helps the uh, reaction with HNO3 and H2SO4 so uh, moving on to the next question uh, what would be the major part of this reaction so this is an alkylation reaction and we know that what's the first step that's gonna happen is gonna happen with the CH3 CH2, CH2, BR, and the ALBLR3 in this case. 
So this is gonna grab that. And then it's gonna become a CH3, CH2, CH2, BR with nail, BR3. Where this is gonna be positively charged, which is now it's a good leaving group. And now you're gonna end up with a primary CH3, CH2, CH2 positively charged. Let me move this a little bit down here so we can. So because we have that positive charge right here, we can do a hydride shift. And then you're gonna end up with a secondary carbon cation, which is more stable than a primary. And now we can do uh, the reaction with this with the toluene. So I mean, without going further from here, we know that toluene is a electron activating group, or electron donating group by induction. So we know it's going to be a para ortho director, and we only have two that are para ortho director. We have B and A. Those are out of the picture because they're meta. So based on this analogy uh that we have this carbon cation that we that's going to be used and not this one this is not possible right we have to use isolation then use like a, a reduction mechanism to go to this we cannot have that from alkylation and that's one of the uh downfalls of alkylation over isolation so a would be the answer so now moving on to question oh Test number two, but because I took them out of the ACS booklet. So from this question, it's asking which structure represents a major uh, intermediate when denitration of toluene. So in the nitration of toluene, we have this group, which is going to act as the electrophile, and HNO3 with H2SO4. So what happens here is that usually you have you know, your benzene ring, which is gonna act as a nucleophile. Let me draw it just to be, you know. Clear. This is gonna grab the NO2, and then you're gonna end up with a para or ortho, because they're ortho, para ortho directors. Actually, let me just draw it this way, make it easier to see. And now we're going to end up with the positive charge right here, alkene and alkene, which is resonance, which is uh, stabilized with resonance. Uh, but now if you notice something is that you cannot have a negative charge, right? Because the uh, toluene is going to act as the nucleophile. So that means that everything with a negative charge will be out of the picture, end up with the two A and C. Now, because we know it CH3 is a para ortho director and not meta, A would be wrong, right? And the answer would be actually C. And the reason to why is that is because you know resin is stabilized, right? Because the CH3 is electron donating by induction, which will stabilize that positively charge. You know, and if you have like an OH here, it will be even more stable because it can actually donate, right? Which is stabilized by resonance. But in this case, we have actually a CH3 in here, which is stabilized by induction. So now moving to the next question. There is not enough space in here. Let me just move this down here. So looking at this one, it's a deals alder reaction. Uh, to be able to do this reaction, I'm going to just draw it out so it'll be easier to see it. Plus SC double bond O, O CH3, yeah, CH3 right here. Yeah, hydrogen and hydrogen. So, as we know, the deals all their mechanism. It's going to attack right here, attack right here, it's going to resonate. And now this group will form a uh, bridge, which is gonna look something like this. So again, I like numbering everything, so just I can keep track. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, and six. 
So between carbon 5 and 6, we have a double bond. On carbon 2, we have this ester group, C double bond O, OCH3. On carbon number 3, we have a CH3. And remember when we when we talked about this, when you're adding this uh, electron withdrawing group, it should be on an endo position, which is like pointed down. So that would be like a hydrogen like that. And then this will be pointing more like down like this, right? Or you can just draw them on wedges and dashes. So the hydrogen would have to be on a wedge and that group would be on a dash. And because these two groups are in the same direction, they both have to be in the same direction after the reaction. So this will be on a dash or pointing down and this will be on a wedge. So from this analysis, let's look back at the uh, at the choices what we have. So first of all, the first one that you can remove immediately is going to be C, right? There's not even the same number of carbons on that one, so that's wrong. Now, looking at the other groups, you can also take this one out because look at the CA2 and the CH3. We know that these two groups are in the same direction, yet in this one, one of them is pointing up and one of them is pointing down, so this is also wrong. Now. Let's look at choice D. Well, this is also wrong because there's no way we can have a double bond here because this is not how the deals order reaction works. And then finally, looking at B, they're both pointing down, which is correct. And we have this alkene right here, which also matches our uh, our product. Now, you probably could have figured out the answer without doing the whole mechanism if you want to save time. I would do that on the test, try to save as much time as possible. I wouldn't go through the mechanism. I'll look because like it's in this question it's kind of obvious which one is the answer. All right? But you know, I was just, you know, trying to explain it. So, moving on to the next question, the last question actually. So, with which reagent can the ketone shown be prepared via the Diels Alder reaction? So, let me just try to do it before without, you know, drawing the whole mechanism. And Number one, if you know if you notice how many carbons we have, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. We have fourteen carbons, right? Same here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Right? So this one's out of the picture. Same thing with this one. Right? Let's look one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. This one's out of the picture too, right? <laughs> well, you can do that for the whole thing, right? So the same thing with this one. So try to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. This one's out of the picture too. So you can just you know figure out the answer is D without even without even actually doing the reaction. But we're gonna do it just you know to go through it. So let's look at D. And the reason why I draw it like that, not the same way they had it, is just because you know, it's easier for me to see it. So it's only gonna take this carbon and go back here, and then it's gonna resonate all the way back to here. So that would look something like that. We have so this is intact, so it stays the same. Now we're looking at double bond O here, double bond O here stays the same. Now we have a double bond right here. Or you can also, you know, do use my method where I just number everything. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So we know this is gonna be one, two, three, four, five, and six. All right, so the answer, you know, it's D, which we already mentioned before. So that, that actually matches the actual answer. My answer is D. So that's pretty much it for today, guys. Good luck on the test. I hope you all do well. And, uh, you know, bye-bye.